Today, I say unto thee, today, verse 43 of Luke 23, I say unto thee, verily, truly, honestly, Christ said to this thief, verily, I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I call this saying the word of eternal life. Because that's what he's talking about, paradise. The word of eternal life. This is our Lord's words from the cross. Preaching from the cross. The word of eternal life. This paradise. What is paradise? Paradise is the place. In the Bible, it's a word used. Not very often, but it's used. To stand for the place of eternal bliss and happiness. Eternal life where believers, after they die... Go to be with the Lord. Paradise is, you might say, heaven. Paradise and heaven are to be with Christ. I know in the book of Revelation and elsewhere, they talk about streets of gold and gates of pearl and all of that, but that's symbolic language too. I guarantee you this, those of our brethren who have gone on to meet the Lord, they're not sitting around talking about streets of gold and gates of pearl. They're talking about our Lord and our Savior. The Apostle Paul wrote of a man, probably himself, who was caught up to paradise in 2 Corinthians 12, 4, probably referring to heaven. And he went on to say that this man, I quote, heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. And what do you think he meant by that? I think what he meant is what, I, what he saw was indescribable. There's no, there's no human words that I can say to you that would give you an idea or fully uh, uh, explain what I saw. I believe that's what it is. You know, he said one time, now I, we see through a glass darkly. But we do see. We see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But John said that when we go to be with the Lord... We'll see him as he is. Paul said, we'll know as we have been known. But this is paradise. There's always been a separation of believers and unbelievers after death. The righteous have always gone to paradise. The wicked have always gone to hell. That's what most theologians say. It seems that paradise and hell are temporary holding places, not a purgatory now. No such thing as that. That's that's blasphemy. That's that's ungodly. That's unscriptural. But the our our spirit, our brethren in the Lord, have gone to be with Him in spirit, and until the day when Christ comes back to judge the world in righteousness, and that's they'll they'll come with Him, and then we'll be caught up or raised to be with Him. But the Lord assures this man, this thief, this malefactor, that he'll be with him eternally. That's the key. This is the word of eternal life. Now let me begin by asking you some questions before we get into the details of this thief. First of all, who has eternal life according to the scripture? Who has eternal life? Well, according to God's word, It has nothing to do with anyone who's earned it or deserves it. Start off there. If you have eternal life and all the blessings and benefits that go along with eternal life, here's one thing you can know. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. It wasn't conditioned on you. And you didn't do anything to get it. It's a free gift. By virtue of the merits of Christ, the power of Christ, and Him alone. His righteousness alone, His blood alone. The man on the middle cross here is doing what is necessary to earn eternal life for His people. That's what He's doing. So when you ask the question, who has eternal life? What does the scripture say? Well, the Bible tells us that all whom God chose in Christ before the foundation of the world, that they have eternal life. In the book of Acts, chapter 13, 
Verse 48, listen to this. It says, when the Gentiles heard this, they heard the gospel that Paul was preaching. They were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And listen to this. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. As many as were ordained. Well, when were they ordained? Well, God looked down through the telescope of time and foresaw who would believe. No. These who believed, they, were, they believed because they were already ordained to eternal life. They didn't know they were ordained to eternal life. I didn't know I was ordained to eternal life. But when God brought me to believe the gospel by his power, by his spirit, then I, then I found out. In the book of John, chapter 17 and verse 2, the high priestly prayer of Christ, it says, Christ praying to the Father, he says, Father, as thou hast given him, talking about himself, power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life, the free gift, to as many as thou hast given him. That's what it is to be ordained to eternal life. It means to be given to Christ. When were they given to him? Before the foundation of the world. He was made their surety. All their sins were charged to him. And he became their surety. Given to him. And what does he say about all those that are given to him? In John 6, 37, he says, All that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. Now you don't know until, uh, that you're ordained to eternal life and given to Christ before the foundation of the world until you come to Christ. And you come to Christ not by your own will, not by your own power, not by your own goodness, but by the power of God. And the new birth. And so he say, and somebody says, well, then it doesn't matter what I do. Doesn't, I don't have to hear the gospel. I don't, it doesn't matter if I come to him or not. If I'm ordained, if I'm given, that's all. No, now listen. Don't play God. <laughs> You're not God. <laughs> You're a sinner who needs salvation. That's what you are. That's what I am. Do you need salvation by God's grace? The answer is yes. You either believe that or you don't. Here's what Christ says in John 6, 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I've heard people say, well, if I'm not ordained to eternal life, if I'm not chosen of God, if I'm not given to Christ, it doesn't matter. If I come to him and I'm not ordained or given or chosen, he, I won't get eternal life even though I want it. No, no. No, if you're ordained to eternal life, at some point in time, he'll bring you under the preaching of the gospel and he'll give you a new heart, a new spirit, a new will. And you'll desire to come to him and you will. The Bible also, who has eternal life? Those who are ordained to eternal life. The Bible also tells us that the righteous have eternal life. When the Lord's speaking a parable of judgment, talking about he the great judge separating the sheep from the goats in Matthew 25. Listen to verse 46. Talking about the sheep, the chosen ones, believers. And here's what he says. These shall go away, in, uh, uh, unbelievers shall go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. But now that ought to raise a question in your mind automatically. He says the righteous shall go into eternal life. Didn't he write by the Apostle Paul in Romans 3 and verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one? Isn't that what the Bible says? Doesn't the Bible say there's none good but God? So here's the next question. How does one attain eternal life? How, does, how, do, how do I attain eternal life? Well, in the book of Romans, chapter 5, listen to these, this in verse 21. It says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. Listen, by Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's the fact of the matter. None of us attain eternal life. Jesus Christ attained eternal life by his death for his people, wherein he put away all the sins 
of his people. Where he worked righteousness for his people, which God has imputed, charged, accounted to them. That's a free gift. God declares his people, sinners saved by grace, righteous by charging, accounting, reckoning, imputing the righteousness of Christ to them. That's why Paul wrote in Romans 4, 6, of the blessedness of the man to whom the Lord imputeth righteousness without works. God gives his people eternal life because of Christ's righteousness imputed to them. The Bible says in Romans 8 and verse 10 that this body, this physical body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So yes, the righteous have eternal life, but they're not made righteous in themselves. They're not made righteous by their works. They're made righteous by the grace of God through the merits of the obedience unto death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And who are they? Well, again, who has eternal life? Well, who has God chosen before the foundation of the world? Who has God given to Christ before the world began? To whom has God imputed Christ's righteousness, justified them based on the blood of Christ? Well, listen to these verses. Here's 1 John chapter 5. Listen to verse 11. It says, and this is the record, talking about the scriptures. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. Do you have the son? And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And then in verse 13 he says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So whom has God given eternal life? Whom has God chosen and given to Christ? Whom has God imputed the righteousness of Christ to? Every sinner who has been born again by the Spirit and brought to faith in Christ. Do you believe in Him? Do you trust Him? Have you submitted to His righteousness as your only ground of salvation and justification before God? Romans 10, 4 says, Christ is the end, the finishing, the fulfilling, the completion, the perfection of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Listen to John 3, 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's not talking about God loved everybody without exception. That's not saying that Christ died for everybody without exception. In fact, a literal interpretation from the original language of John 3.16 would go like this. For God loved the world in this manner, that he gave his only begotten son in order that all the believing ones in him should not perish, but possess everlasting life. That's talking about God's people all over the world for whom Christ died. Christ said in John 10, 28, speaking of his sheep for whom he died, he said, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Whoever he's talking about, they'll never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of, out of my hand. Let me ask you this question. What is the nature of eternal life? What, what, what is it about? Well, that means that everything's going to go well on this earth. No, not at all. John 17, 3, again, Christ's high priestly prayer. He says, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Eternal life is to know God through Christ. To know upon what ground a holy and just God can love me, bless me, have mercy upon me, be gracious to me, and accept me. Upon what ground? the glorious person and the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. How does a sinner come to know God through Jesus Christ? Well, listen to John 6, 68. Christ walking in his public ministry, 
multitudes followed him, and then when they uh, uh, got discouraged or disenchanted, they left, and Christ turned to his disciples, and, in John, and he said, will you go away also? And Peter said this in John 6, 68, Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. The gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified, buried and raised from the dead. The gospel wherein the righteousness of God is revealed. Listen to 1 John 5 and verse 20. We know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true. Even in his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and this is eternal life. Now consider the word of eternal life as spoken by our Lord on the cross to this thief. Here we have the historical account of Christ crucified between two thieves. Now these thieves, we don't know their names. But we know this, they're criminals. They're thieves, they're malefactors. They're great and notorious sinners. Am I a sinner? <laughs> well, of course I am. But the problem is this. By nature, we don't know how much of a sinner we really are. Man by nature thinks he has some spark of goodness or some spark of will whereby he can make the difference between being saved and being lost. Christ did his part. Now I've got to make the difference. That's what man by nature believes. But God's word says that apart from the justifying, redeeming work of Christ on the cross and the life-giving work of Christ through the Holy Spirit, none of us would choose him. None of us would believe in him. None of us would receive him. Christ said you've got to be born again or you cannot see or enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is just as true of these two thieves. Here we have God's man, the God-man, Christ, in between two thieves. And according to Matthew's account, both these thieves at first started reviling, rejecting, mocking Christ right along with the crowd. No doubt these were sinners who deserved their punishment. Mark wrote in his gospel that this was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy and we know this is true of Christ as surety of God's elect, having our sins imputed to him. But here's these two thieves, both railing on Christ. But then something miraculous and amazing, astounding happened. And Luke records it. Now there is no contradiction. You have, the, you have some differences in the accounts, the historical accounts. But it's just like, men, we, we write what we see. That's what Matthew's doing. That's what Mark does. That's what Luke does. That's what John does. They may not have seen everything that each other saw. And so they recorded it as they saw it. And the Lord put it down in his holy, inerrant word for his specific purposes in that specific gospel. But Luke records something that he heard from somebody but this is inspired by the Spirit for Luke to record it. And it's something miraculous, something astounding. It illustrates the way of life. The Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And then it says in Ephesians 2.10, listen, for we are his workmanship. A sinner saved by grace, a believer, a justified person, redeemed, a child of God. They're created by, they're the work of God. Created in Christ Jesus, based upon the blood and righteousness of Christ. Not of works, but we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which are the fruit which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The one who ordained that they have eternal life. And so we know this is, all of this 
illustrates the way of life. And obviously this thief, this thief who began to ch- who, who changed, whom, whom God changed. Listen to what he says. Here, the, the thief on the left, verse 39, one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him. Now they both railed on him at first. Saying, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But now, all of a sudden, in verse 40, the other answering rebuked him, rebuked the thief on the left, saying, dost not thou fear God? Do you not fear God? Think about it. He says, seeing thou art in the same condemnation, the same as the one upon whom he's railing, and we indeed justly, we're getting what we deserve, he says. For we receive the due reward of our deeds. I hear people talking about going to judgment and receiving the due reward of their deeds. You know what that means? That means damnation. But this man hath done nothing amiss. He recognized that there was no sin in Christ. And then Christ said, and he said unto Christ, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Think about it. Now, obviously, this thief had no works to recommend himself unto God. Whatever his situation was concerning a right relationship with God and eternal life, he was totally dependent upon the work of Christ on that middle cross. But here's the way of death also illustrated. Unbelief persisting through death. That's what that thief on the left represents. He, he, was, he was a sinner who died in unbelief. And the wrath of God abided upon him. Some today would say, well, God loved both of these thieves equally. And Christ died for both of them equally. But the thief who believed of his own free will, as they say, came to his senses and finally made the right choice, he chose Christ. But my friend, according to God's word, that's not the case. First, it denies the scripture that say God hates all workers of iniquity, Psalm 5 and verse 5, and that Christ died only for his sheep, God's elect. Think about it. God hates all, you know, today they, people don't want to think about God hating anybody. But here's what I'm saying. God hateth all workers of iniquity, Psalm 5.5. 5. Well, aren't I a worker of iniquity? Not in God's sight. Because what he's talking about there, think about it. God hates all workers of iniquity to whom iniquity is imputed. Didn't David say in Psalm 32, blessed is the man to whom The Lord imputeth not iniquity. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? You see, that's the key. I'm a sinner in myself. But God does not charge me with my sins. He charged my sins to Christ. But secondly, it would be saying that this thief on the right was a better thief than the thief on the left. He's just a better guy. They both were rebellious, but the thief on the right, he was less rebellious. That's not the case. The Bible says if we're left to ourselves, none of us would choose Christ. Thirdly, it would deny other scriptures that say before a person believes, he must be born again. Was this thief born again? Yes, he was. How do you know? He turned to Christ. He believed in Christ. When was he born again? On that cross. There was an illustration given on this that that I believe is helpful. The lost thief, and it's it's an illustration of prepositions. The lost thief represents on and in. He had sin in him and sin on him imputed to him. The saved thief represents in but not on. He had sin in him. He was a sinner but not on him, not imputed to him. And Christ represents on and not in. He had sin on him, imputed to him. He was made sin. The sins of his sheep was imputed to him, but he had no sin in him. 
This man hath done nothing amiss. Even that thief <clears throat> on the cross, newly converted, knew more sound theology than a lot of preachers I know today who've been reading the Bible for 40 years, 50 years. Christ had no sin in him. He was made sin only by the imputation of the sins of his people to his account. But he never became corrupted with that sin. I'm going to talk about that in a later message in more detail. He never became contaminated with our sins. And the point is simply that in the case of the dying thief who was brought by God to believe and repent, sin was in him, but it was not on him. Because having believed on Christ, he gave evidence that the benefits of our Lord's saving work had been reckoned, imputed to him. And again now, I don't want you to misunderstand. In the case of our Lord, sin was upon him. It was imputed to him. He was guilty, but not by any contamination or impartation or infusion of sin. He was guilty by imputation. And he died justly for the sins of his people imputed to him. But sin was never in him. He remained holy, harmless, undefiled in himself. Every thought that he had, every motive within his heart was pure, perfect, holy, and righteous. But in the case of that lost thief, the other thief hanging on the other side, he was not only a sinner, but his sin was charged to him personally. Now how can I know? If my sins are charged to me or not. Well, if my sins are not charged to me, but Christ's righteousness is imputed to me, at some point in time, God's going to bring me under the preaching of the gospel. He's going to give me a new heart. I'll be born again by the Spirit, and I'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This believing thief was one whom God loved in Christ with an everlasting love. He was one whom God chose in Christ. He's one whom God justified in and by Christ. He was one redeemed by the blood of Christ. He was one who was born again by the Spirit of Christ under the truth. The unbelieving thief, thief sadly, was a vessel of wrath from the beginning, whom God hated, whom God rejected, who was not justified, redeemed, or born again. He died in unbelief. And you know what? Christ, the one on the middle cross, made all the difference. The believing thief had no boast over the unbelieving thief. The only thing the believing thief could boast in is the cross. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of our favorite hymns. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And one of the verses says this. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Here's one of the most astounding and amazing displays of God's grace to save his people based on the one ground of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, his righteousness imputed, that you'll ever find. And there's no question about these two thieves as to whether or not they had worked under righteousness for salvation. They had not. And the believing thief said that. He said in verse 40, Dost not thou fear God? No man by nature fears God, Romans 3, 18. But now this thief began to fear God. He began to worship God. He began to respect God. And here's how he did He says, He said, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly. You see, when you begin to fear God, you'll see that if God were to ever give you what you've earned or deserved, based on your best, it would be damnation. If you fear God, you'll know that if you're saved, if you have eternal life, it's grace, grace, 
grace, saved by grace, kept by grace, glorified by grace, all based upon the merits of Christ's righteousness alone. He said, we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. Ask the question. Think about this. If you were to compare this man to one like, let's say, like Saul of Tarsus. Saul in all of his religion. All of his striving to be righteous. Look at this thief. Who was in need of God's grace the most? The thief or Saul? Was it the thief? The world would say yes. Or was it Saul of Tarsus? Well, here's what God's word says. Not one of them was more in need of God's grace than the other. That they were both equally in need of God's grace. Saul of Tarsus, in his religion was no closer to making himself righteous and earning his salvation than this thief. In fact, let's say for the sake of making a point, if this thief had met Saul before this and before Saul's conversion to Christ, and Saul talked to this thief and talked him into a religious profession, a reformation, which would have been Jewish legalism and tradition at that time, what does the word of the Lord say would be this thief's condition? Well, if you read Matthew 23, 15, Saul would only have made him more, twofold more the child of hell than he was. Oh, my friend, think about it. We are all equally in need of God's grace, in need of a righteousness we cannot produce. You know, it's common for people to read about this thief's conversion on the cross and make two very grave, deadly errors. Some use the thief as an excuse to delay because they see this as a deathbed confession, and that's possible. But the Bible says, listen, you're not promised another day. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Remember the parable of the rich fool that Christ spoke of in Luke chapter 12? And the man was going about his business, attaining his wealth, building bigger barns, and all of a sudden, the Lord says, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And then though, then who's, that shall these things be which thou hast provided? Others use this to excuse ignorance. Claim salvation because they reason, well, the thief didn't hear the gospel. He didn't know anything. So I can be saved without hearing the gospel and knowing anything. But the scripture says otherwise. Scripture says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. It doesn't say to everyone except the thief. The scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, except for the thief. No. We're not told everything here about this man's life, but he was a Jew. He grew up under the teachings of the law. And listen to his own words. We can trace his spiritual rebirth back to the words he speaks. He speaks of Christ. His words are a confession of sin. It's clear that both thieves already knew something of, Christ, of Jesus of Nazareth's claim of Messiahship. If thou be the Christ, save us, save thyself and us, they said. But the other thief recognized the extent of his sin in light of the justice of God. Do you not fear God? We indeed justly, we receive the due reward of our deeds. Now remember, the natural man has no fear of God before his eyes. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit. He will not confess the reality of his own sinfulness. And this, this confession comes by the Spirit of God through, through Christ. He will convict the world of sin because they believe not on me. And this is a confession of Christ. Christ. Both his finish, his person and his finished work. The believing thief recognized the sinlessness of Christ. This man had done nothing amiss. And in spite of the fact that Christ came under the same condemnation. Any Jew brought up under the old covenant law would know something of the innocent suffering in the place of the guilty. The, the multitude of lambs that were slain. Substitution. Satisfaction. And I believe this man applied that 
to what he saw in Christ, the gospel. He confessed Christ to be the Messiah. He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. How in the world could you think of somebody dying on a cross coming into a kingdom? This is God the Son incarnate. This is the Messiah. Some of the other manuscripts say that he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That means salvation. A sinner dying as a, a, sinner, dying as a sinner based upon his sins does not come into a kingdom. But the thief was taught of the Lord that Christ would rise again unto eternal life and come into his kingdom. The kingdom of God made up of his sheep, his church, his redeemed ones. And Christ's death, therefore, could not have been for his own sinfulness. This man had done nothing amiss because he had done nothing to deserve it. So whose sins then was he dying for? Well, the Old Testament taught that it was for his chosen people whom God would bring to confess and receive him. The Old Testament also taught that no one would come into the kingdom of God without righteousness. And where do you imagine the thief thought he could find righteousness? Only in Christ, his blood. He said, remember me, call to mind the Lord's memory. He'll remember his people, but not their sins. What does that mean? He knows them, he remembers them, he loves them, he saved them, but he will not charge them with their sins. Words of eternal life spoken by the Lord to the dying thief. Verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. That's the promise of peace and assurance. The promise given to every one of God's people through Christ.